Okay, let's just dive right in, okay? Uh, I'm super excited to get into NFT now. Brand new, sexy looking site, authoritative media outlet. Uh, I'm a personally a big fan. I know a lot of crypto Twitter is, Instagram is, etc. So super stoked to have you guys on. Let's dive right in. Let's start with your guys' backgrounds, okay? We'll go with Matt, Sam, and then hit with Alejandro. And let's get started with that and we'll go from there. So Matt, who are you, bro? What were you doing before crypto and where are you now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I started dabbling in crypto back in 2013, um, but I only just really got recently got into the space full time. Um, I come from uh, my background, 15 years of music and media experience. So uh, in 2015, I founded Billboard Dance, which is Billboard's dance electronic music vertical. Uh, and funny enough, the peak years of that coincided with uh, you know, the, the rise in the crypto markets in 2016, 2017. And so I was friends with all the DJs, guys like Blau, RAC, who were trading crypto, who were getting into the blockchain space. So it was a really organic um, way for me to sort of uh, find my way into it. Uh, started doing the coverage at Billboard for Music and Blockchain, um, did some panels with uh, RAC at South by Southwest, uh, spoke at Consensus Ethereal. You know, we all knew that this technology had the power to empower artists. Um, we're just a little too early. So uh, after that, I ran Spin Magazine as editor in chief uh, and then uh, was running content at Modern Luxury when, uh, when Blau uh, pulled me down uh, the NFT rabbit hole uh, last year. Uh, and for me, it was the technology I'd believed in for a long time, finally disrupting the fields I'm actually passionate about, music, art, and culture, in a way that empowers artists. So I was hooked. And uh, we started the NFT Now accounts uh, in January. Uh, Alejandro and Sam joined as co-founders. And it has been a wild ride since. Yeah, I think, Matt, you have such an interesting insight into the space coming from a, such a deep media background uh, and, and being active with all these DJs. And now we're also seeing like the intersection of music NFTs take on a tremendous wave online. So super interesting. Uh, Sam, tell me a little bit about yourself. What were you doing before crypto and uh, where are you now? Yeah, for sure. So uh, definitely starting around like 2011, 12, 13, I was very heavy into the kind of New York City's uh, tech startup ecosystem. And I'd have to say too, that this kind of whole Web3 movement has so many different similar feelings of optimism and just kind of a communal support. Um, but then after spending a couple of years really focusing on, on helping startups leverage and kind of experiment, understand the needs of their, their uh, early adopters by way of lean startup methodology, design thinking methodology, started actually working with Gary Vee to help him stand up Vayner Talent. So Vayner Talent was a division that was kind of replicating what Gary had done with his own personal brand for other, other talent. So we were able to work with some incredible people, help launch um, podcasts and YouTube series that are now some uh, top 10 business shows across those respective platforms but was very, very passionate about the kind of the music space and the, the cultures that I was really passionate about. So I actually left to co-found an agency called Knox Media. Knox mm -hmm. Media is kind of a digital marketing agency that helps talent and brands grow and convert fan bases online. Um, but even then, too, it's just very passionate at, at, at helping creators thrive and, and helping people uh, lead more fulfilling, successful lives. And when I had a podcast interview myself on a music business podcast um, talking about NFTs and how musicians could really tap into the power of NFTs. And I was like, wow, this is a complete game changer. The music industry specifically, you always talk about this notion of there being no middle class, right? You're either a top 1% artist creating all the revenue in the music industry, or right. you're kind of a starving right. artist. And, and, and NFTs as a, as a mechanism in technology are effectively creating this whole new way to foster community engagement, to help creators across all creative domains thrive and prosper and opens up this middle class. So I was uh, very excited to kind of uh, come together and build what we're building now with, with NFT now, which is a very exciting company. Super, super exciting. And, and last but not least, Alejandro, who are you, man? What were you doing before crypto and how did you get here today? Oh, man, I'm, I'm definitely um, a career enigma. Enigma. I've, I've definitely dedicated a lot of my 20s into exploration and discovery. So I did a little bit of things and a lot of things in terms of politics, policy, um, you know, hospitality. And then I landed on what I love to call storytelling and emerging tech. That, in, that intersection of storytelling and emerging tech has really been my passion of mine in an underlying method. And in 2014, I joined Elite Daily as employee 25 doing innovation and culture. And that year, just kind of digital media boomed and we were able to create some amazing products uh, given 
the generation Y, Gen Y, are voice on that platform. We were competing at some point with BuzzFeed and Vice at the time. We, I remember our peak month, we had 99 million uniques uh, in a single month that happened three months in a row, which was pretty epic. Wow. We running it as a like a team of 45, and then that sold to the Daily Mail historically. I think that was kind of like the last major media, digital media sale for uh, in, in the space before all the algorithms and everything changed. Afterwards, I was incredibly fascinated because I, I was like, if we did it for 50 million, what does a billion look like? What does a billion dollar acquisition look like? And so I wanted to look at it from the perspective of the buyer and not the, and not the seller. So I joined the team at Verizon doing content strategy and acquisitions. And that's really when I got mandated to look at emerging tech and storytelling. Again, that theme was going to be very closely related to my personal narrative. And that's where I got to see blockchain, artificial intelligence, smart cities, compression algorithms, delivery methods, 5G. And I started seeing how all these major technologies were going to start affecting content delivery and, and content stories. And so we we saw vr ar and all these concepts but at the time we ended up purchasing yahoo which you know everybody can read those headlines now and i was able to see what the integration of huffing of huffington post aol and yahoo looked like at, at a multi-billion dollar uh integration process and so that was really fascinating seeing all the pipes and all the building and like the foundational concepts because a lot of people just see kind of like the headline and I just kind of wanted to see a little bit of nitty gritty. Right. Um, yeah. Shortly after that, I left that. And with my passion for emerging tech and storytelling, I founded, I co-founded this agency called Odysseia, where we really started helping uh, emerging tech companies, specifically in the blockchain space. So we worked uh, very closely, for example, with Consensus, helping them launch Ethereal, Open Law, Ethereal, Ethereal Conference, you know, the Ether Ethereum Enterprise Forum, and all these different brands. And that's, that was in 2015, 2016. And so that's where I first got introduced to Ether, uh, Ethereum. And I just got hooked specifically. And that's just really been the, the case for me, as well as co-founding an, uh, an ocean conservation um, nonprofit organization called Oceanic Global, where we used emerging tech and storytelling to drive ocean conservation efforts. And shortly after that, I did a stint in my spiritual world i really wanted to figure out what was who i was because i burnt out we had a little bit of like just disagreement with co-founders and i just kind of wanted to find out who i was and what was i building and like what's going to be my role in the world as this human being as a soul and as as a creator actually so i yeah. took 18 months off i went to asia i did a lot of exploration a lot of deep internal work and i came back afterwards and i worked at a, a stealth ai startup that created another burnout in my life but that burnout really led me to a breakthrough and that's when i recognized that I, my true purpose in life is to help um founders and creators create freedom and fulfillment in their lives and i became an executive coach uh during the pandemic um and it was the most fulfilling work i've ever done and working with these boys sam and uh matt when they came to me uh, with the idea for NFT now, it was just natural. It was like, sure, no problem. It was just serendipity, divine timing, like the roles, the strengths, the weaknesses, the balance of everything. It was just kind of like, you know, I have a phrase that you let go and you let God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So each of you are media powerhouses in your own respect, bringing super diverse backgrounds into what is now becoming the next form of media, aka NFTs. We have the birth of NFT now. Matt, what is NFT now? What, what's, what's the vision? What's the goal? Why even start this outlet focusing strictly on NFTs? Absolutely. Well, um, NFT now is leading uh, Web3 media publication for NFT coverage and curation. Uh, and it fills a gap that we saw in the market. Uh, when we entered the NFT space early, you know, we saw uh, a lot of platforms with megaphones uh, promoting their own drops and a lot of talking head influencers shilling their own bags. What the space didn't have was an independent and credible media brand that people could turn to uh, for curation, for news, for analysis, for features, for industry insights, for storytelling, first and foremost, for storytelling. Um, and so, uh, you know, Alejandro and Sam and I have been friends for a long time, and we were both uh, we were all aligned around uh, the mission of empowering the creators of culture 
and helping drive mainstream adoption of NFTs. Because we believe that NFTs uh, are going to fundamentally redefine how creators engage and interact and create value with their communities across all creative disciplines. Uh, so uh, we, uh, you know, the la when, when we founded this, the last thing that we wanted NFT now to be was just a traditional media company covering NFTs. You know, given my experiences at Billboard, at Spin, uh, these legacy media publications, I can tell you that the Web2 media model is broken. Yeah. It's, it is a clickbait race to the bottom uh, that serves advertisers and intermediaries and sponsors versus a publication's own community. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to do something differently. Um, so rather than going down that old Web2 path, uh, we wanted to build a, a community-centric model, uh, essentially pioneer a Web3 media model um, that focuses on creating value and building community mm -hmm. and sharing in that value being created. Um, so, you know, what we can get more into the details, obviously, on what that looks like. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think first and foremost for us, too, uh, is the idea um, that we, NFT now needs to play a pivotal role in uh, catering to both the purists and the tourists in the space. There are people like us who are in this every day. And we're glued to Twitter. We're in the spaces. We're in the podcasts. We're we it, even even for us, the space moves so quickly. You know, I always say weeks are months and months are years. Uh, so we want to be able to to provide actionable insights, uh, the kind of value to to that demographic. But at the same time, there are there's a vast number of people, an overwhelming number of people who uh, don't know anything about yeah. NFTs, or if they do, a very very small amount. And so central to our approach, especially in storytelling, uh, is uh, welcoming new people to the space, providing resources and handholding and guides, uh, because we all know how difficult these learning curves can be. Yeah, yeah. One thing I want to talk about really quick before we dive deeper into NFT now, what is the love story between you three? Like, how did we meet? How, what, what's, the, what's the story behind that? Sam, Alejandro, someone tell me that story. What, what's the context behind it? Um, well, I, I'd be happy to jump in here because I think I'm the <laughs> cornerstone. And um, so Sam and I met uh, through uh, mutual friends. And for, I think, what is it, like the first two years of our friendship, we actually just hung out at the Russian Turkish bathhouse. Um, every Tuesday, we every Tuesday, we go hang out and just talk about life. We both love personal development and we love about like how do we improve ourselves, how to optimize ourselves. We spoke about biohacking. And all these different concepts and you know we just kick we just kick it and talk to one another and, and talk about our businesses and careers and things of that nature and it was just a great sounding board and finally like he was like yo i'm launching this uh, this podcast called the music business podcast and me as a connector and as a lover of supporting my friends i was like yo i just <laughs> i know just the guy who you got to be introduced to like i know just the guy his name is Matt Medved. He's the founder of Billboard Dance. Like he knows all things music. Like he's just amazing. Um, it's going to be super awesome. And so I connected the two of them. And that's really where the genesis of the trio happened. Matt and I got actually got introduced through our dear friend, uh, James Sternlicht, when I was co-leading when I was co-leading um, Oceanic Global. We wanted to bring an element of music into this event that we did in Ibiza for 5,000 people with headliners such as Solomon, Blondish. It was just like, a, it was a production, it was a movie. And I was like, yo, what better way to get the word out than through that community itself that we want to impact? You know, the EDM community has always been at the forefront of technology, at the forefront of social impact, at the forefront of just creating this great genesis of change. Uh, when you look at it historically, and I was like, yo, Matt, we'd love to have you involved in some way, shape, or form. And so he came in as a speaker, as a supporter, as also a, as an interviewer, and he supported us throughout the whole process. And um, we just started diving into our friendship in a very organic way. I think both friendships were never like forced or anything along those lines. And um, it, over the years, we just kind of became confidants for each other. Uh, we all kind of talk to individually about our businesses and our trials and tribulations and our mm -hmm. career paths. And so there was that, ex that that trust, that foundation of trust was already there uh, because we we spoke about a lot of depth, but also a lot of breadth when it came to things. So, And then finally, when this whole thing happened was because uh, my wife and I, Lindsay, we moved out to Jackson Hole 
And Sam was like, yo, can I tag along? And we're like, yeah, sure, come through. And Sam, my wife, and I, we lived in Jackson Hole together for the, the duration of the pandemic in the middle of a beautiful 20-acre property. And Matt then came to Jackson Hole to visit us uh, during uh, New Year's Eve. And the whole thing happened where in one moment, I was like, yo, Matt, what's NFTs? And then Sam, I came back from Costa Rica from a trip and Sam's there on NBA Top Shop. And he's like, yo, bro, you got to get on this. It's like the, the pack's about to drop. And I was like, wait, I just had a phone call and a call with Matt. Like, cause a month ago, Matt came here with like saliva and eyes pouring out like, yo, NFTs, bro, NFTs. And I was just like, when two of your closest friends are just like wide eyed, like Sam had his wallet out. He's like, I'm sitting closer to the router so I could actually catch the drop. And like Matt, just like with this passion, I was like, yo, there's something here. When the two people that I have so much respect and admiration for, I got to take a look into this. And that's where the whole uh, genesis of our relationship oh, yeah. and NFT now started. Sam, anything to add to that? I feel like I feel like everybody has their own point of view as to how they meet uh, in the R excitement around Russian them. Russian Turkish baths are, are great for personal health and human optimization. So a strong endorsement goes to sauna <laughs> sessions and ice baths. I love it. I love it. All right. Let's dive into story time. Okay. One key part that I want to cover is March uh 2021. Okay. Uh specifically that whole clubhouse era that kind of drove a lot of the storytelling and the narratives and the community around NFTs. I know you guys were extremely active on Clubhouse. Matt, I think that's how I met you virtually. Also Alejandro and Sam, I think we crossed paths here and there at different, different Clubhouse sessions. What are some of the biggest takeaways you guys kind of learned going through that time that kind of influenced the start of NFT Now? Because your focus is on storytelling. And I see the content that you push and the interviews that you host. They're high quality, they're superb. And it references a lot of like, or at least has resemblance of those, those, those inner community sessions that kind of spurred as a drop occurs, as somebody talks about a post drop success, et cetera. Talk to me about that. Well, you know, it, it really was a bit of a perfect storm when you think back on it. Um, you know, we were largely relegated to our homes due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think people were all looking to connect. Uh, and uh, when you have this, absolutely explosive development the the creation of an entirely new creative asset class that empowers artists happens and we're all stuck at home you know we all we all want to get it out and so clubhouse you know clubhouse became a very critical forum uh and 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 air and avenue for for people in the community to meet uh, and share ideas and collaborate. Um, and, uh, you know, well, I think we'll look back on that era as a really formative time. Um, and, you know, some of the best friends that I have made in the space, and I know Alejandro and Sam similarly, uh, were originally stemmed from conversations on Clubhouse. Uh, and, you know, I think that that moment in time showed that, uh, you know, just, just the power of digital connection and digital mm -hmm. ownership as well. Uh, the, the fact that some of some of our best friends are people we actually haven't met yet. Uh, I remember uh, when uh, I met the first, you know, the, my first friends that I had made on the internet, the first URL to IRL in the NFT space was Parrot and Roger Dickerman uh, when they visited Times Square for Artifacts. And I felt like I already knew them, you know? And what's funny is they'd been hosting a podcast to get together for months and still, and that was their first meeting too. Wow. So I think it just proves that distance is increasingly irrelevant as we look forward to a metaverse future. And I will always like cherish that period um, because it was so wide eyed and, and innocent and, and positive. So many artists coming together, creatives coming together, builders, collectors, dreamers coming together uh, to share their excitement and support each other. Yeah. Sam, one thing that's super unique about your background and also like your role at NFT Now, and Matt, this also piggybacks a lot about what you're saying on Clubhouse and the value of community is, well, Sam, you're spearheading community, right, at NFT Now. What does that look and feel like uh, from your point of view? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, collectively, we're, we're all spearheading community. I mean, we think about community in a, in a couple different ways, and I think... Um, at the end of the day, first and foremost, before I like nerd out from marketing speak, like community <laughs> is authentic, empathetic connection, people feeling like they're able to, to get and give value to the other people that they're engaging with. Um, so the, the foundation is, is really that core principle. 
Um, as we extrapolate when it comes to like scaling community, I mean, there's also a challenge too in scaling community, right? Oftentimes like community communities can often have an indirect proportion to as they grow, the value of being in the community actually dissipates. So I think it's something that we're very top uh, that we keep top of mind is how can we ensure that that as we grow and as we grow our aggregate community, it's it's only strengthening the value to every single community member involved. As we get further out from that, like to some extent, we do see community as, as a bit of a funnel, right? Like there's top of funnel community that's engaging on Twitter posts or tweets and Instagram posts and in the YouTube comments. And then, um, I mean, further down the funnel is kind of uh, uh, like in our Discord. And that's really kind of the, the most engaged people in our community. And there it's really just trying to come up with unique ways to understand what are some of their core needs and how can we create value for them too. And I think we'll necessarily be able to share too much, but as we look further out into the future and think about how does community live in a Web3 context? I mean, we're seeing lots of different interesting projects in the NFT space and how community is, is really forming and how NFTs are becoming really just access into those communities, right? You look at, at vFriends and, and all the, the community utility that provides for people that really just want to either have access to Gary or, or participate in the VCon conference he's hosting, right? So I think we think about it as a funnel from top of funnel being a, a lot of social and editorial mm -hmm. content we're pumping out as we move further down towards a place like Discord. And then um, as we kind of project into the future and won't necessarily be able to share too much now, but is uh, what does that that very Web3 native layer of community look like for mm -hmm. us and the people we serve? Yeah, I, I want to highlight one thing that you just said, empathetic connections. And a lot of people that come into the space forget that we're people at the end of the day, right? It's people interacting with people, it's people talking with people, people trading with people. And I love how you use that, but how do you actually go by approaching empathetic connection set? Like, what does that mean to you on an operational level? Um, yeah, so I think like the principles of like customer empathy and really, I, I think there's ways in which you're doing this at scale and ways you're doing this on, to, on a one-to-one on -one level. But I, I think... Um, like really having a deep understanding of like who our customers are, what are the specific goals they have? What are the behaviors that they're currently exuding in order to accomplish those goals? And what are some of the pains that are involved in the process? And, and I think really seeking to have a deep understanding of all those different elements at play and having that really be like plastered at the front of our minds and at the forefront of everything we do. So when we're creating content, we're, we're often referencing back to these different customer personas. So that way there really is this kind of... Uh, kind of reverse engineering the value we create from the needs and perspectives of our customers and the, the people that we're serving. But then I, I think that is kind of a more like scaled approach. And that's why also sure. too, it's like in, in, in Twitter and in, in, uh, um, in Discord, right? There's these places where we can actually have open forum and, and conversation with people. So people feel as if they're genuinely being heard. And it's not even just so that they can feel like that, but it's because like we very much are not only creating for our community, but with our community, right? So when we're figuring out what are the different types of content we want to create, or as we're kind of developing some elements of our different roadmap and plan, it very much is this collaborative sense of, uh, uh, a very collaborative development of our roadmap. So it's it's being able to make sure that we have constant contact, constant communication with the people in our community. So it's not just this us and them dynamic, but we really are, are just kind of one big unit serving each other. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. One thing that I like how you guys are kind of spearheading is one, the high quality content that you're pushing out and the amount of emphasis and detail that goes to doing behind the drop. I think that's super unique and stands out. So applause to you. And I guess like when you guys are creating that how-to content, more of those like narratives, how do you think about how-tos? Like how do you approach creating a piece of, of like let's say an article, a blog, whatever it may be, that taps into the minds and some of the biggest questions that people are facing? Like what does that thought process look like when you're creating that content? You know, I think that it comes back to empathy, just like you, you spoke to. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, looking at Sam, looking at Alejandro, our our whole team, and uh, we have all you know been we have all been novices to the space. We have all we all know that feeling of excitement but uncertainty, and being overwhelmed, uh, and and realizing that the rabbit holes are endless, and knowing that you want to be a part of something but you don't fully understand it yet. And uh, having been there, you know, I always say, you know, I went through the crypto learning curve in 2013 when there were far fewer guardrails, but I still had to go through the NFT learning curve last year. Uh, and I'm not going to minimize the difficulty of it. And there are a lot of people who are going through 
both uh, learning curves concurrently. One thing that we really prize ourselves uh, uh, with uh, NFT now is that our team has varying degrees of expertise in NFTs. Uh, some people are very fully down the rabbit hole. Uh, others are just getting their feet wet. And I actually think it's incredibly valuable to have all of these perspectives on our team uh, because it's easy when you get you know, <laughs> in, in it day to day to forget um, the learning curves that, that got you there mm -hmm. and certain things that you just assume people know and you realize that you're speaking another language that keeps us in check. And then at the same time, being down that rabbit hole being in, you know, having the connections and all that gives us access to, you know, all of the information that we need. It's a really great balance. So uh, I would say that 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 content process comes from a place of empathy and also listening. You know, um, there are there are members of our team who's, who have who have said, hey, like, I, you know, some of our best story ideas, some of our best guides and resources have come from questions that our our own team had mm -hmm. as they were learning about the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes uh, makes a lot of sense. Alejandro, I saw you wanting to add something in the background. Do you, do you want to add more salt to that? I think Matt just hit the nail on the head, but he, to piggyback on that, the guides and the content is really the similar content that we need, that I needed, that I wanted to that I wanted to read. And this is why we jumped at the opportunity. It wasn't so much that we created this idea because it was there. No, it was this major gap and the market was asking for it. And so when I went to look into my own journey as from an NFT perspective, there wasn't these guides, there wasn't an NFT 101, there wasn't like how to reset your MetaMask wallet, you know, these types of things that are were, and I'm crypto, right? Like I've been in crypto since 2014, but these questions started happening and connecting. So Matt just hit it on the nail on the head and it's really about our team leading the way by asking the right questions. And our editorial staff is incredibly amazing. As Matt mentioned, they're, they're just, some of them are getting their free feet wet just now. And so their, their feedback and their perspective is really what's making it happen. And when we speak about the premium aspect of the product uh, that you mentioned, um, that's really the bar that we have uh, internally as a culture. Excellence is really one of the values that we drive. And we wanna make sure that that's reflective beyond the internal culture, but also the culture that we're creating uh, for our community and for our partners. And mm -hmm. when we say, when I say partners is anyone that reads us, really, we don't see them as an audience. We see them as a partner and we want to make sure that we're creating value. And these experiences at a premium level are really, really important. So we always have this phrase internally, like there's always time to do it right. And we want to make sure that we, we deliver best in class products with everything that we do. Yeah. What's up guys, Adam Levy here. Sorry for the quick pause, but I wanted to give some love to our three NFT sponsors that are making this episode a reality. They are Coinvise, Poop, and Social Stack. On Coinvise, you can create a personal or community-owned social token on Ethereum. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Discover more by visiting coinvise.co today. Next up, we have POAP, or short for Proof of Attendance Protocol, who enables a novel way of creating one's life diary. Leveraging NFT technology, POAP facilitates an easy way to mint non-fungible tokens related to meaningful events. It's frequently used in crypto-native communities, and now it's starting to create NFT collectors in the mainstream too. Collect or launch your own POAP today by visiting poap.xyz. Next up, we have Social Stack a platform for communities, brands, and creators to build mission-driven social token economies, offering an easy-to-use non-custodial wallet with a suite of open-source community engagement tools. Social Stack makes it simple to bring your community into Web3 and be a part of creating an open-source, gratitude-driven future for social tokens. Create a free social token wallet, discover mission-driven social token communities, or apply to launch your own token on Social Stack by visiting socialstack.co today. All right, back to the episode. What does it mean to build a media company in Web3? What does mm. it mean to you guys? Well, yeah, it means... You know. Go ahead, Matt. It's a big question. I'd love to hear from all of you. So we, we can start from Matt, we can go to Alejandro, and then we can even hit Sam. Sure. Um, well, look, you know, in, we have a, you know, we, as there's something we say internally um, in Web2, uh, media companies create a lot of value, but can't capture it. Uh, and that's why we've seen so many media companies ailing 
uh, at a time when information has never been more important. Uh, and so for us, uh, we, we see it as um, go to, it's, a, it's a transition uh, from the old model of uh, building an audience as a means to an end of monetizing by being a middleman for brands to actually building a community as an end in itself and directly creating value for that community, whether that's news, you know, breaking news, uh, resources, guides, thoughts, you know, on the upcoming drops, uh, alpha, you know, for for uh, for the you know the projects that are coming, uh, you know, bringing in bringing in AMAs, podcasts, video, all of these all of these pillars uh, to engage our community and provide them with value, and then through this you know through our Web three roadmap creating a way to share in that value too. For those mm. of our community members who are, who, are really, who are really passionate about NFT now, who want to, be, who want to take their membership to the next level, uh, they're going to be able to. Uh, it'll involve NFTs and we'll be able to share in that value as well. Uh, but that's, that's, I think, the really fundamental difference between the media model in Web 2 and the media model in Web 3. The Wait, media model in that Web was 2... An, that was an alpha leak really quick. <laughs> that was... That was the utmost alpha league. I'm just gonna throw that out there. But okay, continue. The media model I, web too. <laughs> I can say no more. But but <laughs> NFT, now, NFT now's future does include NFTs. Um, so, <laughs> so, surprise, <laughs> surprise. Uh, but you know, I do think uh, that, that the most like boiling it down, there is a huge difference between building audience and building community, and there's a huge difference between extracting value and creating value and then sharing in that value. Uh, and we're pioneering uh, what uh, the latter Web3 looks like for media. Powerful. That's super powerful. And there's only, well, you're seeing more of the legacy brands, let's say, approach this NFT model by doing their first drops, by kind of rallying in some of the existing successful NFT creators to create content, right? Um, but I don't think they're thinking about it to that extent. You know, one of the most interesting models that comes to mind is stripping away these credit card subscription models and having people own an, a cryptographic asset that gets them access into XYZ, whatever it may be, you know, and, and not to like talk about other publications, but one thing that comes to mind that I had a Joyce uh, from Global Coin Research where they're, they're like an investment arm. They're, they, they, they do specific type of like analysis around coins and whatnot. And one thing that was super interesting is like, they're like, we're realizing that people don't want to pay one dollar for three months to get access into the Wall Street Journal, for example. Like people don't like that anymore. They don't like the ability of needing to input their credit card, their email, their address, all that stuff, and then that gets them like premium access into gated content. Rather, why not make it more Web3 native, share that value that gets captured, and give people access based off their contributions to that entire community as a whole? Is that how you guys are thinking about it? From a revenue standpoint, I think that that's really a Web2 centric uh, focus, right? Of like, okay. how much can we, there's a transaction, right? There's a transaction involved in that capacity. What we're looking at it is more of a transformational play. And for us, it's about making sure that our community and get receives the value themselves that it's being created within the space. So when we think about the dollar transaction or this concept of barrier to entries, um, I believe that the barrier to entry is always going to be present, especially in Web3. And we see this with models such as uh, Friends with Benefits, who have like a token gated community. You know, there's some uh, even NFTs themselves with specific communities. I'm thinking of like Adam Bombs, for example, who are like, hey, our, our holders will have different concepts. So, yes, there is an evolution of what that NFT pass or that NFT holder aspect gives you in terms of the crypto uh, community concept. But that's something that's kind of similar to what I like to call the elevator model. A lot of it needs to come in. And what do I mean by the elevator model is, you know, you got to meet your audience where they are and bring them to where you want to be. Because if you kind of just disrupt uh, from the very beginning, people will have, will misunderstand. And a lot of our thesis internally is that what people don't understand, they fear and what they fear, they reject. 
And so when we come back to the source of it and it's helping them understand what it is and how it functions and walking them through uh, the process of onboarding those different levels of membership or what the benefits are uh, to holding an NFT or a social token, whatever it may be in terms of the next evolution of uh, token gated or paywalls in that capacity is really about helping them feel like they understand and that they own the power beyond just a credit card transaction for token gated access right. or paywall. And it's beyond the content for us. It's about also thinking about what experiences can we give them? Uh, what type of things can they carry in IRL? Uh, one thing that Matt is, uh, I've heard him say one time, and we hear this now constantly internally in the company is like, how do we make sure that we drive the URL to the IRL and the IRL back to the URL? And how do we continue making that flywheel very real? And I think Web3 is definitely leading the way in that capacity because Web2 has had a very difficult time of marrying those two, the URL and the IRL. Um, and so that's really where I'm thinking about those thoughts when I think about uh, the transaction versus the transformation. So for us, we're really focused on transforming our community versus creating a transaction for ourselves. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I love the community first approach. Sam, how do you kind of think about uh, a Web3 community or a Web3 media outlet? Uh, and wh what does that mean exactly to you? Yeah, I think a lot of the, the core points were raised. So I'll just kind of highlight what stands out. But yeah, I think um, from a business model perspective, it's not being reliant on advertisers as the core engine for our business and for us to continue to level up what we're doing and how we serve our audience. It's it's really, like Matt mentioned, creating and, and giving our community a chance to share in the value that we're all creating together. Um, I think that's at the, the foundation and that's really the, the core mm -hmm. element. So I think that gives us an opportunity to, to innovate on how we serve our audience. It gives us an opportunity to innovate in how our audience gets to contribute to what we're building and, and really kind of have a stake in that future and what that future looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I want to talk about like the future of NFT now, because right now you guys are posting again, killer content, high quality videos, dope articles, dope how-tos, your Instagram feed. Well, I would argue your Instagram account is probably one of the more authoritative Instagram accounts on uh, on NFTs. So props to you guys for building that up to where it's at right now. What can we expect in the future? What, what can the community expect? Lots. We got, we got <laughs> lots of ama amazing things in the pipeline. So I think... Um, uh, from a long-term perspective, I think we have some, um, over the course of the next three to six months, we have some exciting things in the pipeline as it pertains to what our Web3 roadmap looks like. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, I think we're continuing to just scale up the actual content output. I, I think at the foundation of our mission, one is really helping foster mainstream adoption around NFTs. I think Matt already mentioned this notion of like purists versus tourists. So as much as we're really seeking to make sure that we're serving a lot of the, the purists in the space um, that are very kind of deep down the, the rabbit hole, if you will, we also really want to help make sure we're creating content for different verticals that are, are looking and considering how to engage in the space, right? Whether it's music industry, fashion, right? We're already seeing lots of different rumblings, but there's still a lot of people in these industries that really have no idea where to begin um, or how to become internal champions within their own industries and within their own verticals. So I think mm -hmm. it's continuing to scale up um, production and content and output in the community so that we're really able to kind of help fulfill and accomplish upon our mission. Um, those are a couple of the, the core things, but I'll let Alejandro and Matt dive even deeper. I think for us, it's important to kind of bring up what's not going to be in our future. And I want to highlight that very clearly that programmatic advertising has no room or no space within the Web3 media model, like that whole click and follow you through intrusive, like intrusing in your privacy and like, you know, pixels and cookies and all these different things. So. Um, one thing that I love about our website that was a decision, unanimous decision from day one was no programmatic advertising. There's no, there's not going to be banners. There's not going to be refreshes. There's not going to be anything along those lines anywhere near our roadmap for future of Web3. And so we're really looking at creating different partnerships and how do we, how are we going to deliver um, great products for both our partners, our revenue generating partners that actually drive value and create value to our uh, community members in, in that capacity. The other area that we're really looking at is innovating how 
we can actually create interactive IRL experiences that bring the forefront, uh, the digital forefront experience right to the, to the, to the user beyond the URL or behind their, their screen on their computer. We want people to start interacting with NFTs in a completely different shape. So, um, and the other thing that we're looking at in terms of Web3 in our future is we're listening very actively. Um, you know, as we know, we're in the bleeding edge, we're in the cutting edge, we are at the forefront of these new technologies. So for us, it's also very important to listen as to what is occurring in the space, paying attention and observing what has worked, what hasn't worked, and also making sure that we experiment and optimize ourselves. That's really going to be uh, a key driver what we want to do in this space because uh, the mental model that I really love in this in this uh, kind of like to wrap it up is that the map is not the terrain. And so we may have all these different goals in terms of our roadmap, but it could completely shift within the market. So we're really actively paying attention and making sure that this is uh, user and community centric first. Yeah. yeah. Those are, those are great points. And I just want to add, um, look, obviously I can't reveal too many details, but we have very ambitious plans when it comes to events. We have very ambitious plans when it comes to tent poles. We are thinking big. Um, we have so many exciting uh, ideas when it comes to uh, editorial and new franchises for storytelling. Um, this, in this game, information is power. And with great power comes great responsibility. So I also want to highlight the fact that it is extremely important to us as we look to the future of NFT now, that the future that we are building uh, is equitable, diverse, representative, and does not uh, squander the opportunity that we have uh, with Web3 and this new uh, metaverse future that, that we are all building and excited about building together. What a shame it would be if we just rebuilt the same traditional hierarchies, power structures, and inequities that have existed uh, IRL for for you know centuries uh, in this new digital world. Uh, NFT now uh, is committed to ensuring that artists get their due, that uh, diverse voices are heard, and to helping build uh, a new collaborative future uh, that we can all be proud of. I think that's super super well said, um, and I think. We're starting, we, well, at least we saw a lot of those ethos that you guys are picking up on early days of Clubhouse and the types of conversations that were happening. And, you know, being in these communities, you really realize like what you guys just preach right now is truly what's at their core, right? And truly understanding like this is what the people need. They need better, better education. Artists need to be highlighted despite of their background, despite of their past opportunities. And we need to create a better future for NFTs and how they're consumed and, and the education that comes around that. I love it. One thing I want to kind of pivot into next is I know you guys focus a lot on the art side of NFTs. It's very much the focus. What is exciting you, I guess, like in the future, other topics that you plan to cover or that you guys try to front run, whether it be the music side, whether it be the, the metaverse side of NFTs, like, what are you guys thinking about that's next? For sure. So I think the art is the initial breakout category, but very much just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think we saw that largely because this truly created just an actual way for digital artists to be able to sell their work online and create scarcity around some of these um, digital goods. I think we'll see tons of different creators um, across all domains, all sorts of creative industries now have a mechanism to actually earn a meaningful income with their community. Um, I think there's kind of the always been the notion of like 1000 true fans. Um, I think where it's, you don't necessarily need a thousand uh, uh, tens of millions of fans in order to create a, a, a massive business or, or, or truly follow your creative pursuit. I think now there's actual merit to this notion of a thousand true fans because I think now creators are able to have a new model to, to generate income with their community. Um, I think when we think about what happens at scale, like we, we've spoken with various creatives um, that have always had to sell their services uh, to brands. And the whole game was trying to build leverage and build community online on platforms that they don't own. So that way they can have more credibility to get 
better brand rates if they want to effectively sell their services to another brand. Now we're seeing creators across different creative industries that are able to actually earn directly with their community. I think like we mentioned with music industry, like that's always just been such a, a tough industry to make it. Um, because unless you're like that, that whole no middle class thing I mentioned in the very beginning rings so true. I think NFTs change that paradigm. And I, I think when we think about this at scale for creatives across domains, it gets fascinating because this is literally just unlocking a, a whole new realm of creative expression and enables people uh, kind of creates a whole new economic model for people to earn an income off of their own creative expression, which mm -hmm. I, I think is like very inspiring at scale. But I know Matt and Ali will have some other thoughts here as well. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear your point of view because you have such a deep music background and across crypto Twitter, we're seeing a lot of independent artists tap into products like catalog, like mirror, crowdfund uh, or give equity of 50% of their album. Like how, how are you guys thinking about that at NFT now? Well, look, you know, uh, you know, Sam and I both have a, have a, a history in the music industry. Um, music has obviously been a driving force in my career. Um, and, you know, I, I think that I've, I've long been frustrated by uh, the centralized structures in the music industry. Uh, songs are worth more than fractions of a penny for a stream. And I think NFTs help prove that. Uh, people were surprised when uh, music NFT started selling. I think we should have been surprised that anyone thought that they were worth as little as uh, the traditional structures uh, are incentivized to make us feel. But as we look forward, uh, I think, uh, you know, kind of bringing up that that's similar to what, what Sam said on the idea of what those 1000 true fans, um, you know, gone are the days where you had to rely on a likes and comments based economy build an audience so that you could use it as a means to an end to monetize with brands. Uh, all you need, all you need uh, is to build a community of fans who are going to show up for you. That idea of those true fans, uh, because if you have 1000 true fans and you put out a music NFT for a hundred dollars, uh, which is not that much in ether terms uh, and they show up for you, that's a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. And that's more than most musicians that I know have ever seen from the streaming services. Uh, mm -hmm. So I also think as we look forward to the future of, of music NFTs, I'm excited to see music get out of arts lane and build its own lane. Uh, you know, actually, my father, uh, he's a brain doctor, but he's a huge Beatles fan and he actually collects uh, Beatles memorabilia. And one thing I learned about the music memorabilia market is that it's not super valuable until that val until that artist isn't around anymore. Um, so, you know, I think that the music industry looking towards NFTs should be thinking about access and fandom, like a new age fan club. We're bringing back the fan club, you know, owning that NFT gets you, uh, you know, exclusive access, exclusive, um, you know, merchandise, uh, you know, backstage at events, all of that. And you begin to nurture this, this great, this great community uh, and this great interaction. You know, one thing uh, that always stuck with me, you know, as I mentioned, Blau, uh, was the one who introduced me to NFTs. It was a two-hour phone call with him that pretty much changed my life and, and uh, took me down on this path. Um, but he said, look, I know I have fans in Mexico City. I, you know, Spotify tells me I have this many thousand you know, streams from there, but I can't reach them. I don't know who they are. If I'm throwing a show, I can't let them know uh, because Spotify has all that data. The amazing thing about NFTs is that it's the beginning uh, of an incredible connection with your fans. You can reach them immediately. You can take a snapshot and reward them. Um, the possibilities and potential uh, for musicians to uh, engage and reward their fans in Web3 three is, uh, I mean, we've barely scratched the surface of it. I'm very excited. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Alejandro, you want to add something to that? Yeah, man. I think like what Matt and Sam touched on, I think it's like the second iteration of NFTs and the diversification of specific verticals and creator economy. One thing that I'm really excited about is going beyond the creator economy and actually real world utility and starting to see how the everyday person can actually interact with NFTs. And, you know, one thing that I had is was had this issue with my car title being lost when they transferred it from New York to Wyoming when I made the move. And I was like, hey, if this was an NFT. This could be super simple. It could be like, hey, here's my proof of ownership. Here it is. Even if I'm just paying down the, uh, the car payment, the NFT wouldn't be released until full payment is done. So there's no need for middlemen in terms of this. I'm also looking at super, super exciting use cases in real estate. 
how can you commodify the NFT space in real estate? Can you rent NFTs, right? Like Gary V just had launched his restaurant with NFTs, which is following a trend. I've just been receiving a lot of uh, information and a lot of emails from friends who are like in the hospitality business saying, hey, this is what we're thinking about incorporating in terms of experiences in the real world for these types of things. Like, for example, there's this really big, a uh, winemaker that reached out to me and they're like, hey, we want to create wine lockers that sell them as an NFT. And your NFT will actually give you this wine locker with exclusive experiences. So it kind of comes back to what Matt and Sam were saying about creating this interaction between the direct, the direct interaction between the, a provider and the community. And when you start looking at real world utility, that's when the excitement really is going to start. And I'm just so grateful that it began with art and creators. And I'm really excited to see what the third, uh, like the third generation, fourth generation of NFT integration of real world interaction is going to look like. Yeah. Alejandro, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, I know you're very vocal on like the benefits of psychedelics and all, you have a lot of excitement around that. How do you see the merge between NFTs and psychedelics kind of taking into effect? Oh man, this is this is a really really passionate topic that's near and dear to my life. Um, psychedelics help save my life. Full stop. Um, as a high achiever, you know we are society conditions us to believe that it's all about achievement. It's all about the diploma you have, the income you have, the house the, the house you live in, the car you drive, and we can get lost in that sauce very easily. And I think that that's what NFTs is really powerfully breaking that mold of saying like, hey, creators can now reclaim this financial infrastructure of status, of like societal conditioning and allow us to do what we need to do, right? And we see that with like this young talent, as young as 14 years old, you know, creating um art that's being sold in the blockchain and then making four hundred thousand dollars or you know the, the likes of ferocious who is only 18 years old and lived through a you know horrific childhood experience only to come out on top because of his expression and his voice and what i really love about psychedelics and specifically for me i just want to make sure that this is now i am not a doctor this is not any uh, medical advice in any way shape or form and Please look into the legalities of where you're at or where you speak to, um, because th this is still a scheduled one drug. And even though we are seeing a lot of forefront in society, the government has been slow to catch up. And we're, but we're still seeing some uh, some policy reforms at the local and state level. Uh, with that disclaimer, we're starting to see psilocybin specifically for me. It's psilocybin is starting to create this conversation around mental health that it's okay not to be okay and it's okay to share vulnerably it's okay to share openly um but that there is a solution that goes beyond a chemical uh kind of i want to say castration of emotions because when you take these like uh these pharmaceuticals they actually just numb all emotions they're not just like taking you out of your depression they're just saying hey we're just not going to make you feel anything mm -hmm. and so when you start looking at psilocybin specifically I love two things that it does for me specifically. I can only speak to what I, my experience is. It gives me two things. It gives me courage and it gives me empathy. And when you're an empathetic person, you can understand people in completely different ways. And that builds community. Going back to what Sam was saying, empathy is at the core of community. So when you can understand someone, and you can understand where they're coming from, then when you understand something, you don't want to judge it. You don't want to influence it. You don't want to change it. You just allow it to be. And the second part of this is like courage. You know, to be a creator, it takes a lot of courage. It's almost an act of rebellion to put your out, your art out there, uh, to put out your creations, to be out there in the space to say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I've done. And take it or leave it. I'm actually creating something that goes beyond me and bigger than me. And so there's a lot of parallels when it comes to the psychedelics mm -hmm. and the NFT communities around that. And mm -hmm. I just want to, I just want to, I'll cap this off really quickly, but I'm learning so much about 
the future of Web3, for me, I'm obsessed with DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. Like I'm obsessed with them because I just love the whole concept of society building and community building in a decentralized way. And when I was diving into the technical aspects of the technical stacks of DAOs, I was like, holy shit, I know, I've seen this before. I've seen this resource allocation. I've seen this decentralized model. I've seen this connectivity. It's fucking mycelium. It's mushroom. And so what I'm looking at DAOs now is through the lens of mycelium. The greatest DAO that's been created has already existed for hundreds and even billions of years. And it's mycelium and mushrooms. So I feel that mushrooms are intelligent species and that we can actually learn a lot from them, from the physiology and the biology of them to see how we can actually start bringing into the Web3 model of DAOs and the future of NFTs. Yeah. The only reason why I wanted to bring that up and not, not to diverge too much on, on like psychedelic trips and all the, the, the pros, the cons, whatever may bring, okay? I know it's been a hot topic in tech, right? And there's been a lot of funding around, uh, uh, around laboratories, around companies that are experimenting with this stuff. And it's always interesting to kind of dive into a new topic that might have some crossover with new technology, right? And you're talking about it, it's influential from the point of view of like an, an organizational point of view, right? In, in the, the empathetic point of view, courageous point of view, and even the creator point of view. So it's interesting how things kind of like meld and tie together. Okay, I know we're wrapping up on time, but I wanna, I wanna finish off with one final question that I ask every single guest on the show, okay? Um, and don't feel the need to answer right away. You can even take a minute to think about it. Okay. One thing that I love to, to look into is the history of the internet, okay? And we saw how Web 1 was very much read-only. You couldn't really do much other than kind of like communicate. Web 2 came into the picture, ate Web 1, introduced social graphs, introduced all these different SaaS models. People were the products of the companies. Now we're introducing this concept of Web 3 that's supposedly eating Web 2 where people are co-owners of the products that they use, people capture the value that they create, and all the other narratives that tie around it. What do you think will eat Web3? I'm going to take a moment. Take a Thank moment. You. And you guys can even take this from a media point of view too, which could be super interesting. Well, I think this. Uh, the creation of, of uh, you know, Blockchain technology, uh, NFTs, Web3 uh, is a once in a millennium inflection point. Uh, we're entering another age. You know, there was the Stone Age, there was the Bronze Age. We're entering the Imagination Age. Uh, and I believe that our current conception of Web3, uh, I, I think we're, we're still in Web2.5, to sure. be honest. You know, and like I think our current conception of Web3 um still relies on um mediums like our iPhones and our screens and our and our MacBook Pros and the and the like um that we've been using for a long time. Uh to me, Web4, if we could call it that, uh is is that metaverse future, fully immersive environments, uh virtual worlds, um where what like the where our communities and uh, our connection uh, are taking place across uh, entirely new mediums, and uh, I think that what's interesting is there's like like anything you know the the saying you know like any any technology there there's a dark side too is you know I think we've explored what this web four potentially looks like in some very dystopian pieces of science fiction. Um, and I think that, that there's a, a definite need to think about that as, as we chart that path forward. Um, we're not that far off from Ready Player One and, mm -hmm. uh, and Snow Crash, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also incredible opportunity there and, um, and the opportunity for people to construct their own worlds for better or for worse and not just construct them, but own them too. That was the biggest shift from web two to web three is going from a renter to an owner. Uh, and I think as an extension of this idea of an imagination age, um, I think web four is about going from an owner um, to a creator in a way that we may not even fully be able to conceive of yet. Sure.
And I think that's the beauty behind this question is like nobody knows what's going to eat Web3, but each of you brings such interesting insight from your past experiences working in Web2 media and now trying to produce a Web3 media company and leveraging Web3 technology, right? Alejandro, what's your hot take? If any. Yeah, Matt, Matt brought up a really excellent point around like the emergence of these worlds. Um, I, I really don't know what's going to eat Web3. Um, but I do know what's going to be always be present, regardless of what technology is. And that's going to be human connection. And I think the human element will outlive and outperform any platform, any device. You know, we can merge the worlds, metaverse or not. Um, and I think that what will eat Web3, it's not so much about eating it, but optimizing it and evolutionizing it and iterating on it is really the value of human connection. So the human element will outlive whatever technology is there because there's nothing like human connection. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Sam, last, last but not least. Yeah, for what sure. Is, what is your hot take? So I think um, a couple of things. So for without saying what will like eat Web3, I think I'll just frame it more in the perspective of like, what will be an emergent outcome of the next 20 years. And I think we're just going to see, I think we've already seen this general emergence of niche communities starting to formulate online. I think like, um, I even remember when I was like in high school, I, for, I've always been into like cars and motorsports, but it was like a big like Volkswagen fan, believe it or not. And there was like <laughs> VW Vortex, which was like a leading forum for the Volkswagen community and people just pimping out Jettas. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think what we're going to see more and more of is like we're, we're already seeing like I, I think – Web3, just a lot of the democratization of media in general has just created new economic models for um, niche communities to prosper, both as creators as well as communal participants. Even outside of a pure kind of Web3 lens, we've already seen like a, a Patreon and how that's created this new economic model, whether you're a podcaster that has an entertainment oriented podcast or you have some niche um, topic of expertise that you're formulating community around. I think we're going to see new economic models and a, and a more sustainable model for economic sustenance within niche communities. And I, I think that's cool because I think tribes naturally form and people uh, have different interests. And I think now they'll be able to actually participate in communities that may have been this like fringe hobby, but in a more professional way where they can really start to dedicate their life towards some of the things that actually they, they derive fulfillment and enjoyment from. So I'd say that's uh, that's one thing I'm excited to see. I think you're like from forums to Patreon to this new mechanism of shared community ownership. Uh, I'm excited to see all the different like niches that break out. I love it. I think that's a perfect place to end off, guys. Before I let you go, Matt, Alejandro, Sam, where can we find you individually? Where can we find NFT Now? Shill it away. Take it away. NFT Now. NFTnow.com. At NFT Now on all of the handles. Um, you know, uh, encourage you to uh, sign up for our newsletter um, where we're, you know, distilling all of uh, the market happenings into actionable insights. You can find that on nftnow.com. Check out our podcast, check out our videos, YouTube. Um, yeah, we, we've got, if there's Amazing. a resource you need, we're here to, to hear about it and to help provide it. And Matt, where can we find you specifically? Uh, at Matt Medved on most Web2 handles and Medved <laughs> on uh, Web3. <laughs> cool. Alejandro, where can we find you? Um, so I'm going through a transition period for because I changed my lane last year. So on Twitter, you can find me as uh, Luis A. Navia. On Instagram, you can find me as Alejandro Navia underscore. And then on Web3 platforms, just Navia, N-A-V-I-A. Come check out my wallet. Come say what's up. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> and then my this is my email, man. I my email's wide open to the whole community. It's navia at nftnow.com. I read every email. I don't respond to every email, but I do see them. So just I just want to make sure that you're aware of it. And uh, you know, they always say that following up is an act of service. So if you don't hear from me, follow up. Nice. And and Amazing. Sam, where can we find you, man? At, at Sam Heisel. Simple. S a m h y s e l o. Amazing guys. Thank you. You got to do another one of these when NFT now is like a year into the space and killing it and creating all this insane content. 
we'll have to do a recap soon. But for now, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, man. Thank it's you, been a Adam. pleasure. Thank you, Adam.